So, uh, as you remember, we start with the costs. We see the, what the costs are and what the details of costs are. And right now, today, we are going to, you know, analyze firm behavior, okay? Firm behavior. So we are going to start to talk about firm behavior. So to talk about for firm behavior, we should know the revenues part. So previously, previously, we have mentioned about cost part. Right now, we are going to see the revenue part, and then we are going to determine profit. profit. And our main profit in economics is, our main purpose in economics is to maximize profits. Okay? Thank you. Okay. And we have different kind of market types. Okay? We do not have just only one type of market. So we have, just because of the, you know, competition, because of the level, level of competition, we are having different types of markets. So, it means that if the market type, if there is a huge competition, and if there is less levels of comp competition, and our very first market, very first market, is that perfectly competitive market. Why we say that it is a very perfectly competitive market? Because in this market, there is really competition between or among the sellers and buyers. For example, if you could think this, you know, circle as a market, there will be a lot of buyers, there will be a lot of sellers. So it means that among the sellers and among the buyers, they, you know, all these dots represents a seller or buyer. So there will be a competition. So why competition is, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's healthy because if you have a supply and if you have a demand to have a well-functioned supply and to have a well-functioned demand, you should have a very, you know, intensive competition. So we are going to, you know, firstly uh, mention about the, you know, different, uh, uh, firstly we are going to look at the pure competition or perfect competition market. So then comes monopolistic competition. On the monopolistic competition, it's not as much as perfect, or competition as much as perfect in the perfectly competitive market. And then we are going to move oligopoly. Then we are going to move monopoly. Okay? We are going to move monopoly. Yeah. So uh, we, we are going to explain. It. We are going to explain. It. Just just let me show you this one. There is point A and there is point B. You want to go from point A to B. You want to draw a line from A to B. So let me ask you this question. How many lines pass from this point? No, no, no. How many lines pass from this line? Thank you very much. Infinite. So, where will you know that which one goes to B? You have to have a reference point. You know, if you have a reference, you know reference? So reference means that every time you will compare others with this one and you will determine whether it is competitive or there are some problems on competition. Okay? Every time the uh, perfectly competitive market will be our reference. We will compare other types of markets with this one and we will draw a conclusion how the, you know, level or how the, you know, uh, the intensive, how intensive the uh, competition is uh, are on the other markets. So, <clears throat> when we are talking about, you know, uh, perfectly computer market, we are just going to mention uh, these three and plus one more feeder. The very first feeder of the perfectly computer market that there will be a large number of buyers and sellers. It means that 
if you are in a perfectly competitive market, there, will, there should be large number of buyers and sellers. I think it's clear enough. We don't have to give a further explanation. So second one. Second one is that, so uh, there will be a homogeneous products. What does homogeneous products mean? Homogeneous products means that identical products. Identical products means that there is not any difference between the products. So, what does in, in the chocolate, what does generally chocolate, uh, you know, include? Cocoa. Cocoa, Cocoa, sugar, milk, coffee, or so on. So, you generally don't do like that. Oh, all the chocolates include the cacao, so let me eat some cacao, some sugar, and some, you know, uh, what else, milk. So they are going to be chocolate in somewhere. Okay, they are going to be chocolate in You don't do that. You don't do like that. Why? Because there is a perception. There is taste. There is brand name. There is a lot of differentiated products in the chocolate market. So it means that chocolate market is not, yeah, it's not perfectly competitive. And also you could draw this conclusion that in the chocolate market, the products are not, products are not homogeneous or products are not uh, identical. They are differentiated. Also cars. For example, car means that there's a four wheels, one wheelchair, gas pedal, you know, brake pedal. So it means that, oh, it is, it's identical? No, it's not identical. Because for every brand name, for every brand name, you have different perception, quality different, price different, or so on. So it means that if you are in a perfectly competitive market, you are going to have a you know, you're going to have a homo homogeneous or identical products. Also, you know, there is, um, uh, for this market, if, if any, any firm wants to enter this market, there is not any huge obstacle. There is not any huge, you know, prevention. Yeah, prevention. So barrier, there's not any barrier. So any, any firm that they want to start a business in this market, they could do that. It means that, for example, for, because of the legal, you know, structure, you are not, allowed to do everything, okay? Uh, for example, let me give you this. If you want to sell weapon, is it easy to sell weapon? Yeah, weapon. Yeah, oh, I have uh, three or five or six or 10 missiles. Do you want some or, <laughs> you know, we generally don't do that. Or it's not easy to go to this market, okay? And in, in for example, <coughs> if you want to sell a weapon, who uh, will be the buyer? Yeah, generally, for example, government would be the buyer. I mean, yeah, yeah, hunters. But uh, there is not a huge competition among the you know buyers also. And uh, for example, what the buy, uh, hunter will be with missile? Uh, take some missile and uh, hunt the deer or something? No, of course. So it means that it means that there are a lot of market types which the, there is not a perfect competition. So we do have this one. But we, we, don't have, we don't have it in, in real life. Why we don't have it in, the, in real life? Because the feeders that it requires is not easy to find. It's very challenging. Homogeneous products, I told you, it's, very, it's not easy to find. Or uh, easy entry and exit is not easy to find. Also, uh, negligible firms, for example, think, think about Azerbaijan uh, GSM market. There is Zercel. Axel, R, R Mobile, and uh, you know others, so on, cell phone, or so on. So it means that in this market, in this market, we cannot accept it as a perfectly competitive market. There is just a bunch of com uh, companies, bunch of firms. You understand my point? So it means that we are going to every time we are going to take it as a reference point, and we compare others with this one. And we will see that how much others are competing. And also, if there is a large number of buyers and sellers, it means that uh, for an individual firm, how much of uh, they produce the total production in the market? Yeah, just it's a small fraction of, small fraction of, you know, small fraction of production is done by individual firm. So, 
Are they have a huge influence on the market price level? So we, we call them, they are a negligible, okay? So it means that they don't have strong, they don't have heavy influence, or they, they don't have chance to influence the price, price uh, market price. So because of every individual firm in the perfectly competitive mar market are called as <coughs> price takers. Price takers. What does price taker mean? Price taker means that if a firm enters to the market, as they don't have any chance to change price, what are they going to do? They take the price. What's the given price? They are going to accept it. So in every market, as you know, there is a supply and demand. So their supply and demand will intersect and there will be equilibrium price. So in this equilibrium price, they do not have chance to change it. They do not have to change, uh, you know. Yeah, they will accept it. So the firms that they accept the... Yeah, if, if supply, supply increase or demand decrease or supply, uh, you know, decrease, no problem. There will be new equilibrium point, but when new firms come or the existing firms in the industry, they are going to accept this price. So it means that they don't, do, don't have any chance, uh, you know, to pro, uh, affect the price. Yeah, change the price. So it means that they are, they are not price, uh, they are price takers. No, 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 no. Any company, any company in this, in this market uh, is the price taker. Why? Because you are producing as a firm, as an individual firm, you are producing just only small fraction of the market. So let's say that the market volume is 1 million units of production, 1 million units of production. The one firm, you know, just only produce 1% of it. So it means that if you increase or decrease price, others will not care about you. You want to increase price as, uh, for example, uh, you increase price to, let's say that the, the uh, market price is five. If you increase price six to six, you are producing just only 1% of the market. So nobody will care you and nobody will come and buy from your company. Because as you increase price to six, you will be seen relatively expensive when they compare you with other, other companies. Also, if you make it four, the price is four, it's not rational. Why it's not rational? Because you have a chance to sell it from five. Why you will do it for four? So even if you make it you know, uh, four, everybody will come to and buy you. So as you are producing just only 1% of the uh, you know, market sale, so then you are run out of your production, then price will also go, go back. You, know? you, you are not uh, allowed or you are not <coughs> not allowed, but the market structure, market type doesn't let you go much that further. Yeah, kind of, kind of. So because there is a sphere, there is a, you know, very strong uh, competition. Yeah, there is a tough competition among, you know, producers uh, and consumers. So of course the competition is healthy. We accept that competition is healthy. Yeah, because uh, we will see right now, we have a perfectly elastic demand. So uh, quant of a good demand will go to zero. As you are uh, expensive, relatively expensive, they are not going to prefer. I mean, they are going to substitute million other firms' products in place of your firm's product. So you will get regretful. Okay, let me show you this one. So as every market, our perfectly competitive market has it is very nice supply curve and very nice demand curve. So when they come together, when they come together, of course there will be a, a equilibrium price. But when you took it as a as a as an individual firm, so it is for market. But when you took it as a uh, you know for, uh, when you took a demand curve for individual firms, you know production, you will see that it is perfectly elastic or, you know, horizontal. Why it's like that? It means that I, I explained to you just right now. If you increase price, 
quantity of a good demanded will go down to zero. If you decrease price, you know, if, if you go up, you know, uh, with infinite numbers, so you don't have any chance to do anything. So it means that for a, just for individual firm, for just individual firm, you know, demand curve will be horizontal. Zamik Nazarov, uh, why it's so? Why for an individual firm, uh, the demand curve is horizontal, or why, why it's like that? Yeah, because this firm is price taker, thank you very much, and? Yeah, increase or decrease. From this price, as this firm is price taker, they could sell as much as they can. But if they increase price, nobody will buy from them. If they decrease price, yeah, you know, just they are producing just only a small fraction of the market, so it doesn't make change. It doesn't have any chance to influence the uh, market price. For example, let's say, let's say this one. If a GSM market, if GSM market, if Axel decreases the prices, what's going to happen? They will, no, no, they will influence the market price. They have a chance to influence the market price. Others, you know, say that, oh, this company is decreasing the price. We should do anything for this. So it means that they have a chance, they have ability to, you know, influence the uh, market price. But in this case, in a perfectly competitive market, they don't have any chance to, you know, decrease or increase or influence. Yeah, of course, it's not perfectly competitive market. Maybe there is a lot of buyers. I mean, on the buyer side, this is perfectly competitive. But on the seller side, it's not uh, per perfectly competitive. Is there a real life example of uh, unfortunately, we don't have. But there are some, you know, there are some market types, they, they come closer to it. For example, wheat market, or um, if I say the tomato market, but you know, the technology improves, they are coming up with the new tomato ideas, for example, uh, uh, the different shapes of the tomato, it's not oval, or the different colors of tomato. So, yeah, they, they generally say that for the wheat, and they generally say it for the gold. For example, they say that the gold market is uh, gold market is a, is very close to perfectly competitive market. Why? Because gold is gold. You know, gold is gold. Can we call on Pepsi? In fact, we no, just because uh, th there is there is just they have a they are highly differentiated. We said that if you are in a perfectly competitive market, if you are in a perfectly competitive market, uh, goods should be homogeneous. But this fizzy drink, that we don't use brand names generally, this uh, fizzy drink, it's not homogeneous with the other ones. For example, let's say that the, uh, you know, other fizzy drink, it's the same color or so on, you drink this, but the taste is different at least. And the price is different. You understand my point? So in real life, it's hard to find this. But it, as I said on the beginning, it is a, it's a, a, how you say, it's a reference point. Every time we will compare others with, yes? Not exactly. We will come there, but not exactly. In real life, in real life, you know, just we, it's not easy to find it. It's not easy to find it. Okay, you understand this part, right? Yes. So also, if, as your colleague said, Elvin Yagov, Mr. Yagov, are you with us? Nice. So, uh, for example, your, your colleague said that just uh, uh, seven minutes ago. He said that if the income of buyers go up, what's going to happen? If income of buyers go up, of course, as this normal good, then demand will shift to the right. As demand shifts to the right, then it means that in this market, in this perfectly competitive market, there are going to be new equilibrium price. But for an individual firm, demand curve still doesn't change. So for an individual firm, demand curve is still horizontal line. Why? You know the reason. So they are, so Gardashali, D sub 2 means that this individual firm is Again, price taker. Thank you very much. It was a very good contribution. So, uh, 
you know, it means that it is, yeah, it is six dollars, six dollars, but uh, it's six dollars and our firm is again price taker. Supply and demand conditions determine the equilibrium price and this firm is price taker because it is negligible, just produces small fraction of the, uh, you know, firm. Yeah, go ahead. Why the price increases from five to six, but demand increases also? No, 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 no. The, the, the causation, causation is not from this side. Let's say that the income of buyers increase, income of buyers increase, demand increase, because of this reason, demand curve shifts to the right, and as a result, we have a new equilibrium price, and this new equilibrium price says that the equilibrium price will be $6. So, as the equilibrium price is $6, as an individual firm, this firm is going to take this price because this firm is price taker. Thank you very much, price taker. Okay. So, profit maximization means yeah, we want to we want to you know maximize the profit, and in economics we accept that main purpose of firm to maximize profit. So, when you want to maximize profit, you have a total revenue and you have total cost. Yeah, you are going to maximize the differences between these two, you know, uh, variables. If you could make the difference maximum, then it means that you could make your profit maximum. Okay? You have a total revenue and you have total cost. So, your total revenue is 500 but your total uh, total cost is 959 459 it means that your total profit is one you know units or one Azerbaijani monarchs so <coughs> so if you you have a chance you could produce more and you could sell more so you could increase this and you could maximize this difference then of course you are going to make your total profit maximum okay so we have two options uh, for this one. Just let me, yeah. So you know that when we want to uh, calculate the total uh, profit, excuse me, total revenue, total revenue, how much you uh, sell quantity of an individual firm multiplied by the price. You are going to find total revenue. So it's very easy to understand. And also about your average revenue, average revenue. So, oh, I mean just you want to know that on an average basis for per unit of, per unit of production, how much money, how much money does your firm make? <coughs> Total revenue equals price multiply quantity. Average revenue equals Total revenue divided by quantity. So, right now for the perfectly computer market, and uh, we are coming to a, a very interesting point. So, you could see that it means that it means that we have a quantity, and this quantity moves to the other side of equation. What we are gonna get? Price. price. Thank you very much. So it means that average revenue equals price. price. So firstly, the first conclusion we drove so far, price always will equal average revenue. It's just a mathematical issue, okay? Ar arithmetic. So let's keep going. You have a question? Oh, go ahead. Oh, in your textbook, in your textbook, they do like that. Uh, for, a, for a market size, they use uh, capital letter. For individual firm, they use just a uh, lower case. So if you want to go with that, we, we also could use the you know, small, well, lower case. No, 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 no. Just, so, but I'm referred to the individual firm, so you could, for, on your textbook, it's just a, a lowercase. Anyways, 
And your marginal revenue, your marginal revenue saves you change in total revenue divided by change in quantity. So it means that if you increase production one unit, if you increase production one unit, how much your total revenue will go up? It's marginal revenue. If you decrease production one unit, how much you know your marginal uh, total revenue will go down? Again, it explains us marginal revenue. So, but you already know that you already know that for a firm, as it is a as it is a price taker. Thank you. As it's a price taker, they are going to charge the same price. Marginal revenue is zero. Yeah. No, no, no. Not like that. So, for example, let's say that when they sell 10, 10 units of production, want to increase it uh, 11th. Last unit or one more additional unit brings you additional revenue of uh, additional marginal revenue, five. You increase production from 11 to 12. What's going to happen? So marginal revenue equals price. price. Average revenue equals price. So in the perfectly computing market, price equals marginal revenue, and they equals marginal revenue. You understand what I said? No problem. OK? Price equals average revenue, and it includes uh, marginal revenue. Humay? Everything's OK? Nice. If a producer of 10, it's a uh, price of uh, 20 capex, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, it means that average, uh, average the producer earn 20 capex from yeah. the product. Yeah. 10, 10 yeah. So, but for the perfectly competitive market, for the perfectly competitive market, in the other markets, other market types, if you increase supply, if you increase supply, what's going to happen to uh, you know uh, price? It's generally go down. But as in the, you are in a perfectly competitive market, you do not have chance to decrease or increase price. So there is a certain price, given price. Excuse me. There is a given price. You have to accept this price because you do not have any chance to change this price. As you accept this price, as you are price taker, then it means that you could sell as much as you want from this price. Then it means that additional units of production will bring you the same amount of revenue. An average basis, it's going to bring you the same amount. So because of this reason, in the perfectly competitive market, Mrs. Sharifova, in the perfectly competitive market, Okay. In the perfectly competitive market, as your colleague said, thank you, Mrs. Sharifova, uh, price equals average revenue and it equals marginal revenue. Nice. Very nice answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For the other market types, price equals average revenue anymore, but, uh, but not, not marginal revenue anymore. Just, okay? Nice. As you're, uh, you, you're, you're comfortable about this one? So far, nice. Okay. Please look at this one. So we have a quantity, we have price. Please look at the price. Price doesn't change. So it means that if you want to increase the total revenue, so you could increase it, you know, yeah, you could increase it by producing and selling more. There is not any, there is not any limitation on your production. There is not any limitation about the you know, price go down or uh, go up. So it means that you could easily do that. You could uh, produce more and make more money. So if I draw that line, you will say that it is? Yeah, nice. It is total revenue line. Thank you very much. And on this part, total revenue. And on this part, quantity. So. You produce zero, you make money zero. You produce one, your total revenue is five. You produce two, your total revenue is ten. 
You understand my point? So it means that if you are in a perfectly competitive market, it's very important. If you are in a perfectly competitive market, your total revenue curve is, you know, uh, is a straight line. Just, just, Zam, let me ask you, Zam, go ahead. Why is this uh, curve? So, can you see this one? Okay. So, what does it mean? If you are if you are producing zero, the price is five, but your total revenue is zero. If you produce one, your total revenue is five. No, no, no. If you produce two, your total revenue is ten. You understand my point? So, it means that as long as you keep producing more, as long as you keep producing more, you have chance to increase your total revenue. So as we are in a perfectly computer market, you are going to increase the production, and of course, total revenue will go up. So because of this reason, as the price is, as the price is constant, as the price is constant, slope of the total revenue will also be constant. So because of this reason, this is why it is straight line. For example, not, not like that, or not like that, you know? Why? Because the slope here and the slope here and the slope is different. But in this curve, the slope is all the same. Why? Because slope of this curve is determined by the price, and price is constant, so it means that it's going to be a straight line. Yeah. You are going to ask a question? Okay. How the firms profit, uh, maximize profits? So, we have two types, two methods that we could maximize profit. First one, you already know that, Islam and Shafli. Oh, very nice answer. Uh, if we maximize the difference, if we, if we maximize the difference between total revenue and total cost, our total profit is going to be maximum. So other point is that, other you know, uh, way is that, we could look at the marginal revenue and uh, marginal you know, costs. Please look at this one. You already know that, you already know that, price equals to marginal, marginal revenue. And you already know that how the marginal cost curve is, and you already know that what marginal cost means, What's the definition of marginal cost? And you know what's the uh, definition of marginal revenue. So what you are going to do? You will bring them together. When you bring them together, you could easily find out the profit maximizing level of output. Okay? Profit maximizing level of output. So, uh, what, uh, I'm sorry, I just go there and come here. So, um, just, just because I should use whiteboard too much, I have to move from there to the other side. Um, what does marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost? What does it mean? It's good. <laughs> it's good. But what does it mean? Okay, so it means, it means, okay. Okay, let, let me show you this one. Okay, it's our price equals marginal revenue. And let's say that the price is 50. And do you remember this marginal cost curve? Okay, very nice. So, if you are producing, let's say, that a 10, and you are moved from 10 to 11, so you know that, you know that, when you produce one more unit, 
your go up and go to the vertical line, let's say that it is 30. So what does it mean? It means that just because you produce this additional one more unit, just because you produce that one additional one more unit, your cost will go up 30, let's say Azerbaijan and Manats, go down. Your, your revenue will go up 50. No, 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 just, the, it's the quantity, okay? It's the quantity of production. And it's the, you know, cost and revenue lines. So, what does it mean? When you produce one more unit, so marginal costs uh, and marginal, marginal revenue and marginal cost shows you that how much money, marginal revenue shows you that how much money one more unit will bring to you. And marginal cost means that how much money you should pay or you should have a cost for the extra unit of production. So you are producing 10 units of production. You increase it to 11. When you go to 11th one, when you go to 11th one, just because of the last one, just because of the last one, you have to spend 30 Azerbaijan monads. But because of the last one, you are going to make 50 Azerbaijan monads money. So it means that just because of you know, this last production, you will make extra 20 monads. Yeah, we could call it marginal profit, no problem. Marginal profit. So, let's look at this one. You know why it's like that, because there is an uh, increasing marginal product, so our marginal cost curve uh, goes down, and there is a diminishing marginal product, so our marginal cost starts to increase. So, in this case, you are producing the 11th, 12th one, what's going to happen? Your marginal cost is 29. What about your marginal revenue? Again, 50. As you are a price taker, you are not able to change the price, and you are not able to change the margin, margin revenue. So it means, that, it means that as you are producing one more unit from 11 to 12, it means that you are going to, just for the last one, just for the last one, you are going to make 50 Azerbaijan monads. But just for the produced last one, your cost is 29. So it means that your extra or marginal profit, as your colleague said, 21. So where these marginal profits will go to, it will, you will add up these to total profit. You see, you, you add up to, to, to your total profit, let's say that the marginal profit, it will go to total profit, it will go to total profit. So what does it mean? It means that if you keep going to production, if you keep going to production, you have a chance to increase your total profit. So let's look at this part. You are producing, uh, for example, let's say that 30 units of production. So when you are producing 30 units of production, you produce 31. So when you increase the production one more unit, one more unit, what about your uh, cost is 30 and your, uh, you know, revenue, marginal revenue is 50. Let's say this one. You are producing 40, your cost is 45, and your marginal revenue is 50. So when you produce from, let's say 39, when you produce, increase your production from 39 to 40, 39 to 40, yeah, just the uh, marginal revenue is again 50, marginal cost is 45. So it means that you have a marginal profit of five. Where it will go? Total profit. So as long as you keep going like that, as long as you keep going like that, you have chance to increase total profit. When this will end? In this point. So let's say that this is 50, and marginal revenue equals marginal cost. It means that if you keep going more, you are going to lose some money. And your total profit will start to go down. So, so far, I mean the 50 units of production, you have a chance to 
Yeah, you have a chance to increase the total profit. You produce more, you make more money. You produce more, you make more money. But please look at this one. Let's say that you, you, you produce the 61. So when you produce the 60, thank you very much. Your marginal cost, your marginal cost equals 70. Your marginal revenue, as you don't have chance to change it, 50. It means that you lose this money. When you use this money, it means that your total profit, as these are marginal numbers, we cannot say that you have an exact loss, but we could say that your total profit will go down. Maybe you, you are going to, you have a total loss, not to, total profit. But, but, <coughs> if you are rational, I believe that you are rational. Do you believe? Yes. Nice. Two people believe. It's very good improvement. <laughs> so, in this part, you are not going to make production. Why? Because the extra units of production doesn't let you make money. It just makes you lose money. And what about this part? On this part, you have a potential you know, output. You could increase production, and you could make more money. And as we are in short run, as we are in short run, for example, you will not choose 10. You will not choose uh, 30. Why? Why we are, you are not going to choose 10 or 30? First, we have chance to maximize. Other, other uh, reason is that you have fixed costs. If you stop production, you have already incurred, you have already spent these fixed costs. Yes, so if you stop production or if you stop there, it means that your average fixed cost most probably is very high and you, you, ha you, are, you, have, a very, you have a very, you know, favorite expression for this. For this. Underutilized. underutilized. Thank you very much. So in this part, it means that you are underutilized. So you have a, a certain amount of fixed inputs. So you, because of this, you have fixed costs, but you do not use it efficiently. And what about this one? You are overutilized, and of course, uh, the problem is that uh, problem is that you have increasing costs. You have increasing marginal costs. So if we uh, share the marginal profit uh, curve, it will also find the marginal profit. You could say that it is decreasing. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it goes with the marginal product. Not marginal cost, but marginal product. So as marginal product increase, increase, yeah, marginal product increase. So why it's with the marginal product? Because you make margin, if your marginal product goes up, it means that you will sell it, you will make more money. So your margin, margin, margin profit will go up. But when there is a decreasing, then you know, the profit also starts to decrease. So you, you understand this one? So, so we came to this point. So we will say that Profit maximization level of production or product for this firm is 50. Okay, it's a, it's a generous generous uh, nomination. Uh, for example, let's say that the Q star. So in the Q star, uh, when you move to the Q star, as marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, you have chance to increase the total profit. But when you exceed this one. You have your marginal cost uh, exceeds your marginal revenue. It means that you are going to agree with the decreasing total profit. But in this part, in this part, you know, when the marginal revenue exceeds uh, equals to marginal cost, you are going to make your total profit maximum. So, so, what's our purpose? Our purpose to make the profit maximum. So, to you want to make the profit maximum. So you should answer this question. How much I produce, which price should I charge? So you are not allowed to, you are not free to choose the price because you are a price taker, but you could choose the production decision. So you say that, my decision is that. I am going to produce 50 units of production and these 50 units of production will let me maximize profit. In perfectly, perfectly competitive market. Only in yeah, only in perfectly competitive. No, no. This marginal revenue equals uh, marginal cost. It's also valid for other, uh, you know, other market types. Okay. So 
when your marginal revenue uh, equals to marginal cost, it means that in this point, you are going to choose, you are going to pick the level of production, so you are going to produce this. You have a question? Go ahead. Point Q? Yeah, yeah, cool. you could say Q star. Q star. Because on the Q sub 1, for example, Q sub 1, uh, you still have room to go. You still have chance to increase the total profit. And on the Q sub 2, you know, uh, you, yeah, you, you just, you, you, it's not rational. It's rational behavior. I know that you are very excited for the rest of us. But because it's break time, and we have to conclude. Okay, let's have a break time.